Hey everyone out there, this is Evan from Shock Collar Records based in uh, Williams Lake, BC, Canada, a DIY punk label and we do creative works and whatnot. And uh, today's show, I have my co-host here, Matt Granlin from Stranded the Australian Canadian Music Show that he started at CITR in East Vancouver, the campus radio station. He now lives up in the Caribou region as well. And today we have a very special guest. He's actually one of my uh, favorite punk rock writers, lyricists and singers, um, lo and behold, this is Jeff Pizzatti of Naked Raygun and the Bomb. Been waiting a long time to do this podcast with him. And uh, uh, yeah, so here we go. Thanks for being here today, Jeff. Sure, glad to be here. And uh, hi, Jeff. My name is Matt, and uh, I'm actually quite a new fan. I'm a punk rock enthusiast, but uh, from Australia, and uh, okay. I've been really enjoying getting to know your music. My first question, actually, Evan and I are both Italian roots, and I know you have Italian roots as well. So I figured I'd ask, um, are you connected well to your Italian heritage? Well, both all of my grandparents were born in Italy, um, and uh, I knew them very well, all four of my grandparents, but uh, I, never, I never actually been to Italy, but I did join 23 Me program for uh like kind of like ancestry.com you know and uh i thought i was more italian than i actually was it turned out i'm only 34 percent italian i don't understand because my family's lived there for like 500 years but um i guess it's not good enough but uh, <laughs> uh apparently i'm more french uh, i'm more italian than anything like 34 percent but 33 percent of me is french and german too so and it just depends on how far you want to go back i guess yeah uh, and what about in Chicago itself? Is, it, is there a large uh, Italian population there? Uh, there used to be. They all kind of moved to the suburbs now, but um, I mean, this was a little Italy part of town, but one of the mayor dailies decided to plunk University of Illinois right in the middle of it, so he kind of destroyed it on purpose a long time ago, like in the 50s or something. But uh, there's a lot of Italians to live here. Sweet. Cool. Yeah. So, Jeff, you have a raccoon rescue with your uh, partner there in the Pizzati rescue, right? And today you had uh, a yeah, pickup, I guess. I, so how was today? My fiance and I uh, run a, a raccoon rescue mostly in squirrels. She, she, she does most of the work, though. I just kind of build structures and things. She does all the day-to-day handling of the animals, though. And uh, she's a really good good person. She's uh, very, very devout to it and uh, does a good job. But uh, yeah, today we picked up a Another enclosure for we're going to put the, uh, the we have a uh, right now we have one bunny one one uh, possum and uh, one really sick raccoon and then we have also seven uh, six or seven uh, outside raccoons that overwintered because they're they didn't have a tough time uh, they were born a little late and they were kind of small to release in the fall so we kept them over over the spring, over the winter and now they're about to be released in any day now looking forward to that cool. Man, that's that's good dedication, and that's too bad about the sick one. Last year, she actually moved 70, 70, 70 different animals through here. Wow, yeah, that's insane. Can't imagine, man. That that that's great though that you're, uh, you know, doing it for a good cause. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know? Yeah, it's really awesome. Cool, cool. smart animals. They're super smart. They're really cool. How long have you been doing that for, Jeff? And how did it get started? Um, somebody just brought over a raccoon one day about four years ago, and so Kristen took care of it. And since then, we've taken in a couple cats, and we kept the cats. But she released releases all the raccoons as soon as she can, you know. They give some their mother mother who deserts them, or people find them in their attic, and they lock out the mother or something, and all sorts of situations that you can't imagine. But um, they get hit by a car or something, and they need re- 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 rehabilitation. But it's pretty interesting, really awesome animals. Oh wow! Yeah, thanks for sharing. Cool. Yeah, and uh, well, to move it to uh, to Ray Gun, um, so it's the first album in 31 years. It's going to get released this spring on Wax Track Records. Being a huge fan myself and uh, hearing a couple of the teaser tracks you sent me, I'm pretty stoked to hear it, Jeff. And uh, just wondering how that all came about, and because you've been working on it quite a bit lately. And yeah, it's all finished. It's done for a long time. It's a long time to get out there. Um, we really fussed around with it, and this, over the years, have added to it, and we finally got it concrete. We, we didn't know whether to, whether to release, it, release it ourselves or have someone do it. We finally found that Wax Track Records is really interested, which is really cool because uh, they're good people. They've been around for years, and daughter Julia runs it now. Uh, her dad used to run it, Jim Nash. My sister actually worked for the label for a long time under, under Jim Nash's rule. But uh, if she was the only employee, was the only employee there for years. But uh, um, she, Julia, revived it, and she's doing a good job at it. So we decided to sign with her, and uh, couldn't be happier. Oh, that's awesome. Pretty stoked for you and um, stoked to get the new album and the complete. Because you sent me a couple of songs, um, you know, uh, Amish's and uh, actually, yeah, Amish's. How did that song come about? And 
And by the way, where where did you record the the record anyways, like in the studio? And what was the process like? We recorded a studio in Chicago called Transient Sound. I actually designed the heating and air conditioning for it. And there's another business I used to have. I sold my business a long time ago, but I used to run a heating and air conditioning company. I was pretty good at design and stuff. I designed their heating and air conditioning. It's super quiet. Super quiet for a studio. It's pretty cool. I got to do that. But anyway, we recorded there with a guy named Steve Gillis. And he actually had it masked. He's an awesome guy. He used to play drums for the band called Filter. They had that song, Hey Man, Nice, hey man, nice Shot. Oh, I remember that, that band, song. yeah. Yeah. So he recorded, he, he has a golden record with them. And uh, and he, he he's a super guy. He, he recorded us and really got into us. So he really made us sound actually better than we actually are, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, he was really into it, and he had he went to have, he went to the mastering session in Nashville, Tennessee. A guy moved down there from New York City. He actually mastered the Hotel California album. Wow, very different genre. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's, it's really weird that he would do us, you know. But I guess they do anything that passes or crosses their path. But he did that, and it's you couldn't be happier with the mix. It's really hot. It's really really smoking mix. Yeah, it sounds great too, and um, yeah, I really, I really like the new tracks that I've heard so far. You know, especially the the music video one, uh, "Living in the Good Times," which I actually participated in submitting a video from the fans. It's a cool video. Yeah. People could be on it. We address our fans. We sent them a, all the notices they could be on it if they wanted to be on it, and they sent their videos back and they kind of mouth the lyrics to the choruses and they're singing on the choruses. Cool. And um, the, the song "Amish" is is off the new record, and. I was just wondering how this song came about. It's got great lyrics, and uh, I guess we can play this one as a teaser for, uh, for your new record coming out. Yeah, that'd be good. Play that. I don't know. I just thought I, sometimes it's lyrics just fit with the music I'm playing, and I just said the word Amishes. I just said the word cartridges, and I need something to rhyme with cartridges off the first line. I just picked Amishes. thought it was funny, and plus I can't complain about it. It's, everything's so PC in the United States right now. It's fucking ridiculous. But... Uh, I think I'm just going to complain about it because they don't listen to they don't have any electricity, so. <laughs> yeah, um, they won't have the internet to actually hear it. No, I'm not I'm, 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 I'm ramming on the Amish. It's, it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be more of a joke, more of a fun fun song, but um, I don't know. It's a fun, they hope that hope nobody takes it too seriously and gets a, they notice out a joint by it, but no. everybody got to fucking relax out there, man. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Just love the music and don't take things too seriously, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, you can read, you can read something in the Beach Boys songs too. You know, if you look hard enough. Oh yeah. <laughs> True that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's Amish's off the new record.
Amish is anyway. You don't uh, plural of Amish is Amish. Plural of Amish is Amish. So it's funny to say Amish is it's totally oh. incorrect. You know. Yeah, I never thought about that. Also, it's funny. What What is the name of the new album? Do you have a title for it yet? Yeah, it's called Over the Overlords. Over the Supposed Overlords. Like it's not It's not being over them and over them physically. It's being done with the Overlords. Like we're done with the Overlords. Like over over the over over it over uh, the Overlords. Okay, cool. I like Very it. Very cool. Pretty strong name, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you need a strong title. It's been thirty-one years, you know, uh, and I've only been on yeah. this in this on this earth for thirty-one years. So I'm like, whoa, okay, okay, yeah. It's pretty, pretty uh, mind-blowing for me, at least. Yeah, we really took our sweet ass time doing that, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> totally. And actually, speaking of going back in time, I'm I'm curious, Jeff. Um, the original uh, post, well, punk and post-punk era. Um, of course, New York and LA is well documented. The scenes there. I wonder if you're able to describe how different the the Chicago scene was at the time when you were coming up. Well, Chicago kind of started behind the times. So we were a little late with starting starting with live bands. Mostly started with discotheques, you know, playing punk music. And uh, I went to a bunch of those and got influenced by that. Like they would always play the Buzzcocks, and I'd always run up to the DJ and say, "Who's this song by?" And they'd always say, "It's the Buzzcocks." It's, it seemed to always be the Buzzcocks for me, but. That's how we kind of sound like them, I think. We liked Wire and we liked Stranglers and we liked a lot of those bands like that in that era, the second wave maybe. But uh, I think that's why we kind of sound sort of poppy and same kind of chorus as like. The big woes. But Chicago scene was uh, Chicago scene was very slow to take off in bands. We started out a very small scene. You, know, you knew a few other names and stuff. I grew from there. Got to be a huge thing after a while. And I guess sort of less less media attention at the time, but uh, but maybe you know friends really supporting each other and, and getting it done, hey? Yeah, you kind of had to. I mean, there was Minneapolis bands like Who's Who Do who went to the West Coast and became famous and signed to Warner Brothers eventually. But uh, Chicago bands that got signed were like Liz Fair and uh, is Billy Billy Corgan's band is uh, who's his band again? Smashing Pumpkins. Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah, they 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 kind of got signed after, after everybody turned their head to Chicago and looked at the bands that they wanted to sign. They signed those bands. We were, really, we were sort of out of, out of the out of the picture by then. We had sort of retired by then, but uh, we we cranked it back up about ten years later. Yeah, and so I guess Naked Raygun. After you guys did your final few releases uh, uh, before your almost like fifteen year or so hiatus, I'm just wondering like how that happened and like what. I mean, I know that you started the Bomb, which is a great band as well. I love the Bomb, and uh, so in between then, like I mean, what what was. Uh, kind of the lead up to your breakup and or the hiatus and then you got back together so obviously you guys remain friends but john Haggerty actually uh became the guitar player of peg boy who's also from chicago so i was just kind of wondering uh what your thoughts or or, or any of the history behind that if uh whatever you want to say about yeah, that yeah john, john left before the first album was before the last album was out he left uh after understand was recorded he left the band and started Peg Boy right away, and he was right, yeah. kind of disappointed that we didn't ask him to join back in when we got back together. But um, uh, we had Pierre Kessie, he was playing in Peg Boy and Naked Reagan at the same time. He since passed away, but um, he wrote some great songs for both bands. I, I don't know if he wrote any Peg Boy songs, he wrote some great songs for Naked Reagan. He wrote Treason, and he wrote um, Home, and he wrote, uh, let's see, right? He wrote uh, all, some other big hits too, I can't recall right now, but. Um, he's a great guy. He passed away. We really miss him. But uh, we got we broke up basically because we were going to have kids. We all had kids. I had two children. Uh, they're both 25 and 28 now already. But uh, and then Eric had four kids, and Pierre had four kids also. Really sorry about about the loss too again. And yeah, I mean you guys uh, you guys must have been through a lot. Yeah, so we got it back together because uh, I think Mike from Riot Fest really got us back together. He likes to put together bands and have them at Riot Fest. So he offered us an awful lot of money to get back together. So we got it back together and played a couple of shows at Riot Fest and pre-show, pre -show, some pre-show shows, you know. And, and then we played some after-party shows as well. It was, it was a good time for a couple of years there. Good deal, we really, yeah. Really playing in front of some huge crowds there. Yeah, I saw I saw some of the, the live footage, you know, that looked like a pretty good time. It's awesome that you guys got back together, and I'm super stoked for you and stoked that you're putting out this album and still still carrying on after all these years it's pretty amazing you know that shows Thanks, man. yeah for sure i think it's awesome and this guy, and this guy from canada named Mevin called me and played guitar for me and sang a song <laughs> yeah when i first he sang that song for me on the guitar i thought that was the ballsiest thing i've ever seen man it's so crazy i was like i got off the phone and said hey babe i said to Kristen, hey babe this guy just sang a whole song to me one of my songs that i wrote myself she said you gotta be kidding me i said no 
I did, dude. That was that was fun. I felt like I had to, man. Like, uh, I, I, yeah, because being a musician and a punk rock kind of band guy myself, I, uh, yeah, it's just it's like that energy goes into me. I give it back, you know. I love your music. Yeah, so. It's the totally right attitude of punk rock, by the way, Evan. You, like I told you this before, but you just get out there and fucking do it, man. And that's what that's what it's all about. Just getting yeah. out there and doing it. Yeah. Whether you're any good or not, and, and you have that <laughs> wonderful wonderful attitude of doing that you know it's i really it's really admirable man that means the world coming from you jeff man like uh yeah and that's 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 what i want to do yeah it's just go out there and do it you know like there's no there's no boundaries really you know like yeah and thank you yeah like one time one time my brother and i watched this video about Benjamin ireland they had on like, like the undertones and the miller bands and they had this one guy who just got up there and just blasted out music all by himself in front of this wall you know just singing really shitty and he's just singing as good as he could though and my, i got it done with the film and i said isn't that guy really sucked that last time my brother said to me no, that guy's a brilliant guy you know he's this guy who actually is he's, he's, he's what punk rock's all about and so it changed, changed my mind completely about punk rock my brother was a big influence on me oh that's um, awesome car, car thing was. that's yeah. awesome yeah that's that's what it's all about for sure yeah and it's yeah it's cool it's like it never ends too and it's like it, it is a tight knit community and like, it's cool. Cause like punks, you know, like, like the DIY scene and everything. It's like, we all, we all kind of have each other and support each other. And, and no matter what, no one's like a, no one's like a stuck up rock star really or, or whatever. Cause you know, it's like everyone just right. like, you I, know, helps I each other. About Chicago yeah. area. I thought, yeah. thought if we can embed the punk rock mind thought in the suburb, in the suburb of Kansas, Chicago, the suburb, suburbia, you know, It'll never die ever because someday, 20, 20 years from now, you see some goth kid walking down the street, you know? It's fucking awesome. Yeah. That's a, totally. It'll never die. We'll never die. Uh, speaking yeah. speaking of the punk rock spirit, Jeff, I, I am curious, do you know any any Australian punk bands I'm going back? I should say. Yeah, yeah dude. I was really into the Lion Spiders. Oh, yeah. Recently, I've been in this band. I can't recall their name. They're really aggressive, though. They're, uh, I think it's the name says with the S, maybe? There's some band called uh, two names like something Richards. It's something Richards. Uh, Stiff Richards. Oh, okay. You like them? Uh, I'm not familiar with them, but I'm, I'm, if it comes recommended from you, I'm going to check them out. Yes, yeah, they're called Stiff Richards. They're fucking great. Uh, okay. My uh, Chicago experience w- when I traveled through their backpacking, I got to see the Hard Ons play at the Beat Kitchen in 2006. They're a legendary Australian band. Have you ever checked them out, the Hard Ons? No, I never heard. I never heard of them either. No, they didn't play the Beat Kitchen. I should have been there. Yeah, two thousand and six. I couldn't believe it. Um, the stars aligned. I think you'd really appreciate them. They're like uh, Australian legends, and and as far as a punk rock spirit, they are about as 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 uh, the, the is absolute the essence of it coming from Australia. So there's my recommendation. <laughs> you, you, saw, you, saw, you, saw, you saw you saw them in two thousand and six. Yeah, two thousand and six at the Beat Kitchen. Well, yeah. that, that was, they were they were they were a different order than they had really good they had really good tortilla soup there that day. Ah, that okay. Day that okay. <laughs> really excellent food there. I used to go all the time and eat there. Oh, excellent! Well, we got to drag Evan to Chicago one day. I, I found the city absolutely enthralling. Actually, um, this is a bit a little bit from left field. I don't know if do you happen to have any uh, any Steve Albini stories from back in the day um, that you know you spend a lot of time with him? Like anything because he's he has a reputation of being a little cantankerous, but he's probably got a couple of different sides to him. He's got a lot of different sides to him. If he's in front of just one person, just talking to him one on one, he's a decent guy. But if he's in front of like ten or ten people, he can be a real dick for some reason. Um, I don't know. He gets like. It becomes like he's on stage or something, but um, I, I always like Steve. I've known Steve for a very long time. I, I him for I, I played in Big Black when it first started as a band. You know, he he had, he had a four, four song EP out before I was in the band, but he put that out himself. And then uh, I was on the first two EPs and the, the, the single to follow, seven single to follow that called Big Money on one side, and I think uh, El Duce was on the other side. Um, I played on those two songs, and that's the last thing I did. We we played a. We played a tour all the way to the East Coast, and our last show was at a place called The Channel, and uh, Meat Puppets were headlining, and uh, this asshole came out from The Channel, and he, he said, came to our van and said, okay, the Meat Puppets are getting half their pay, and we're not paying you fucking guys at all, so if you want to play, play. If you don't want to play, get out of here. Oh. We said, fuck you. We said, fuck you. We took off. <gasps> oh, well, that's the only thing you could have done. Channel in Boston, what a bunch of pricks. <laughs> then later on, Nick Reagan played their sold out crowd with Henry Rollins on the bill, too. And that was, I think that the guy was gone by then, but anyway, 
it's my story about this channel. But I have a lot of Balbini stories. One day, this guy from Strike Under, who Pierre was in his band with, a band called Strike Under. They were around when Naked Reagan first started, too. They have a great single, out, a great EP out, if you can't catch it. Um, really brilliant songwriting. But uh, really advanced songwriting, like really like choruses and and, and uh, bridges and stuff. Like Naked Reagan just had like a bunch of screaming going on at that time, you know. But they actually had songs. And uh, Pierre was in that band. And... Uh, the least lead singer from that band was kind of known to be kind of a drunk and kind of a reckless guy. But in front of Wax Tracks Records, which is on Lincoln Avenue in Chicago, he picked up Steve, he saw Steve Albini, he picked him up, and he was going to pretend like to body slam him, but he actually did. He, he stumbled and fell and did body slam him, and then he ran into Albini's head and, uh, with all his weight and almost crushed his fucking skull. Oh. But uh, Steve got up and took it like a, took like a real man. I don't know. I thought he should go to the hospital, but he didn't. But anyway, Steve, Steve really apologized. Steve, Bjork, Steve Bjorklund, the guy who landed on him, really apologized. Bjorklund, Bjorklund's brother, uh, Chris Bjorklund, played guitar for Strike Under 2. But um, I have a lot of Albini stories, yeah. Oh, thank you. Albini yeah. has all the cool microphones. Like, I said, how do you get these cool microphones for your studio? He said, they find me. <laughs> I designed, designed a heating air for his studio, too. I designed all, actually, I had it installed, too. All the heating air conditioning for his studio, I, I designed, too. It's really fucking quiet. Oh. But... Uh, his studio is made out of his studio is made out of the walls are made out of a uh, adobe brick. He had it all shipped in from Me New Mexico, and it's like it has the sound absorbing quality. It's really incredible because it's earth, you know, and it's like just sun dried earth. And he has it stacked on top of one another like bricks, hmm. and all those walls in the studio are made out of that. It's really fascinating, but uh, quite a, quite a building he lived he built in and lived in there. Wow. The other thing about Abini is he only will deal with a band. If he can talk to the band himself, he won't deal with any managers or anything. He insists on talking to like Iggy Pop himself and, and let, he recorded Led Zeppelin, so he insists on talking to Robert Plant and Jimmy Page himself. He won't deal with anybody but the band. So he doesn't want, he doesn't want to be fucked around by any management, you know? Hmm. And he wants his money up front and he just charges one flat fee. Like when he recorded the, the, the Nirvana album, he just got one flat fee for that. If he had gotten percentages on that, he'd be a multimillionaire, but he just wanted one fee. He's kind wow. of a righteous dude in that. That's integrity. Give anybody the tour if you go to his studio. He's really good about it. Look at the whole tour. He has a kick-ass set. And I said, kick-ass collection of microphones, though. He has so many microphones. Can't believe it. Yeah, I, I, sang, I sang in his studio through a pre, pre-Nazi pre German microphone. Whoa. How did that come about? Where did that... Wow. I guess the microphone from, like, 1932 or something, you know? What What album is that? Like, I, I got to hear that song. Let's let's get that song up. On this. Yeah. That's all on... No uh, What's the song called? I don't know. What did he record for me? He recorded, he recorded half the bomb, half the first bomb album. Oh no way! Oh, and that's with that microphone, the first album. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs>
you can you can look really careful at the at the at the, at the lyric sheet on that and at the cover. You can tell what songs he did. Oh, okay. And uh, I was actually going to bring that up because I, I, you know, obviously you've been in many different studios, but I remember chatting to you before about uh, the record Indecision by the Bomb and how it was uh, produced by uh, the guy in Nashville, right? And like, you, like it was a special kind of studio set up for that one, and or you showed the song um, Could you need Hard, Hardly Shed a Tear, and you showed that to someone, and they really, really liked it and i was just wondering about the recording of indecision and um indecision, yeah. indecision was recorded by jay robbins oh okay jay robbins was was it in nashville or was it mastered by someone in nashville or some big studio uh, or something oh i don't know i don't I think who mastered it but steve oh, okay. Rob, jay robbins recorded it in uh in i think in baltimore we recorded that one where he lives at his studio maybe and uh he flew out to do the next one though he flew out here he flew out to do uh uh, what's it called? Uh, one of the guys on the train. Something about speed. Uh, the name of the record is uh, Speed is everything. Speed is everything. Yeah, yeah speed is everything. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Sorry, uh, I forgot to, forgot to name of my own album, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh pretty yeah, he, yeah. he flew out to do Speed is everything, and yeah. he recorded he recorded uh, the album you're talking about, Indecision, in uh, at his studio in Boston. But he's he's a great guy. He's he was in Government Issue, then he was in Burning Airlines, and he's much bunch of bands after that, you know. But He's, he's really talented. That's awesome. And and uh, just off the top of your head, what what would your what would be your favorite song off the album "Indecision" by the Bomb? Um, I have to say the song "Indecision" is the best. Yeah, uh, is, 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 is the song for the Helena's on there? That's on. I think that's on two of the other albums. Song for the Helena's one of the best songs written and that we ever wrote. Pete wrote Pete wrote that, but um, yeah. the song "Indecision" is brilliant too. So Jeff Jeff Jean really cranked on guitar in that. Up from the floor is pretty good too. Like up from the floor. Yeah, the first song on that album. Yeah, that's a great one. Gets you. Funny when we wrote the that, the drummer so they played it. I they, I don't like it when this music is written before the lyrics, you know, or before the song melody. So I don't I don't really consider it a song until you get a melody. But Jeff Seen would always come to practice with all these chords, and he played all these chords. Jeff Seen's a really talented guy, but he just laid down these chords, and I would have to try to think of some fucking melody after he already played the chords. You know, it's very difficult for me to do. So we played. We must play. We must play up from the floor about twenty five times. And, and one night after practice, the drummer said, I, said, I hate this fucking song. This is, this, is my, this is the worst song we have. And then the next second, next time he played it through, I sang it. And then he, then he, said, he said, put down the sticks and he said, that was the best song I ever, I've ever had. It's a funny, <laughs> funny story. Awesome. So yeah. you brought the life to it. And uh, on that note, let's, uh, let's throw that song on. This is uh, the bomb. Let's put on Up From The Floor Off Indecision. It's a rocking song. <laughs> Attack, put him on my back, attack That's what 
Okay, so we're back here with Jeff Pizzetti, and uh, I'm wondering about the recording of your debut solo EP, which just came out, I guess, just in this last year. Was this a long-term goal for you, Jeff, or was it more of a pandemic project that sort of materialized when you had a lot of time around the house? Um, I had those songs for a long time. Uh, actually, at all of them for a long time. They recorded a lot, some of them recorded a long time ago. Some of them I had to re-record because I didn't have good versions of them, but... Um, I kind of just wanted to put out something myself just to get it out there. I had these songs sitting around. They didn't really fit any band I was in, so I had to get it out there. I just put it out. I have another six songs that are going to come out with later to a second EP. Then I'm going to put them together as one album eventually. It's all that. But um, I got six, six other really good songs, too. Oh, fantastic. Is there any other songs off the EP you'd like us to play today? I can play Make Me, uh, Make Me Whole. That'd be great. That's my big hit. I love how that song's so dynamic, by the way. And you do everything in it, right? Like the piano and like everything you yeah, hear. Yeah, played everything. Drum machine, played all the stuff on my on my uh, wonderful Korg Korg uh, synthesizer, all the strings and everything. And uh, couldn't say enough about that Korg machine. It makes it sound really good. But um, the piano is a real piano. It's my mom's baby grand piano. I mic'd it, mic'd it up and uh, just recorded it all myself. But I only sang it through one couple times. I'm actually kind of off key in that song quite a bit, but. And the acoustic guitar in the beginning is way out of whack. It's way out of tune, but so it could have been more perfect, but it is what it is. I kind of like the mix.
pretty amazing song. And it was uh, never mastered either. Never, never got mastered or anything. So it sounds pretty good at even not being mastered. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, as long as it's like loud enough. I mean, as long as you can crank it up. Yeah. 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 What, what, it's just so called Pizzati, right? Pizzati, yeah. yeah. It's just called Pizzati. And it's on Spotify, iTunes, and Bandcamp as well. So. Yeah, it's on, it's on Amazon Prime, too. You have to say, Alexa, play me music by Dipper Neil Pizzati or something like that. It's really hard to get on there. Yeah, so if, if you have a, uh, an Alexa out there, just say, Alexa, play Jeff Pizzati. See what happens. Yeah, you got to kind of search for it. You gotta name, and then you have to have the full package, too. You can't just have the one package. You have to have all the music, all the music options. They sell it, you know. You have to have the, uh-huh. the big... The big Full, full audio package by them. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. I, I I myself don't have Alexa, but I've uh, I've hung out with a couple different Alexas before. <laughs> yeah, we, we we my Christian and I make, make playlists on there. We say we should say Alexa, play my playlist. It's really great. She just goes through like to play yeah. like anything you put on there. You know, she's a Peg Boy into Naked Reagan into into Who's Your Do into oh, crazy. Minor Threat. It's really great. You have, into into Morrissey into uh, into front 242 into fear tears for fears and to whatever you find everybody just every tell her to play she just play it make a playlist out of it. it's really great i love that alexa thing i have her turning on the lights in our in our living room and she can make them any color you want to i said alexa make all the lights purple and they just go purple in one second whoa pretty cool yeah i got this light bulb I a special light bulb at home depot they cost like 17 bucks for two of them it's really great yeah. oh yeah i've heard of those I, I that's something i want to get eventually yeah they're funny they're funny because you make, you make all your lights pink or something really funny and kind of make them go with the music and stuff like that like or like blend it's one of those we do that like, like late at night when we watch tv and then eventually yeah. it gets too late out and we want to put on something a little darker in the room so we put on some blue light or something it's cool yeah totally the, that's a good mood for for a dark room too yeah cool yeah i guess uh, yeah i was is there any plans for the new album? You said you did a uh, a live uh, shot for Vans. Eight songs at a Van Vans venue that's called Vans the Van Center or something. Van. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think it's called I think it's called Van Center or something like that. But it's a big place that holds about a thousand people and it has a good big stage in it. But they only let like ten people in it now because of COVID. They're they're run by a, they're run by a, they're they're controlled by a fans in California and California's really freaked out about getting anybody any of their people getting COVID or any of the any of their People come in getting COVID, so they uh, they only let ten people in at a time. There's only going to be five crew and five band members, but eventually they let a few more people in than that. And uh, they don't let any crowd in though. There's no crowd there, but I think they're going to present it like there's a crowd there or something. They're going to present it like it's live or something. So it'd be oh, pretty okay. cool. We played cool. we played five songs, eight songs, and I sang them really crappy because I hadn't sang very much lately. And I, and this guy Dan Walensky, who played guitar with us on three of the songs at that at that session. He played it because he two guitars and for Peacemaker and two guitars for Treason and two guitars for this for, for Living in the Good Times. He played guitar in those three songs and he he's also mixes. He's a, he's a good engineer and he took the songs and saved my ass because I really sang him pretty crappy and he, he made him sound really good. Oh, yeah, he did some tweaking. Yeah, he, he auto tuned me, he pulled me out of the mix and auto tuned me and then he doubled it a little bit, put a little slap on it. It sounds really good. It sounds, it sounds much better than I sang it because I'm a little out of shape of singing because I haven't played for a year and a half and we had five practices and I couldn't quite get it by then. But I messed up some of the lyrics in in, in uh, one of the songs, but that's okay. Well, it's always good to knock the rust off with the band, and um, that's that's awesome. So, is is that supposed to be kind of a, it's like a video audio live stream, or like not? Well, obviously not live, live, but like just like a video thing that's going to come out in the near future. Yeah, I think it's the eleventh, the eleventh of March, actually. I think it's going to I think it's gonna show it on van vans dot com on the eleventh of March is what I what they're telling me. But um, oh, okay. Cool. I'm not sure. I haven't seen it advertised yet at all, so that's kind of weird. Oh, uh, so they're probably still editing it or something? Yeah, I saw Rough Draft. Rough Draft, Rough Draft looks pretty good. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that'll be good to see. It's good that you guys are uh, taking all this action on stuff. I, it just, it's just really too bad about the COVID, how, you know, like, it's crazy to think, like, there's no shows allowed. You know, me and myself being a performer and a uh, show promoter, it, it's crazy because sometimes I'll, you know, I'll start getting in that, like, downside, like, oh, like, I can't do this. But then I'm like, wait a minute, every single band in the world is not really allowed to do what we did before, you know, the COVID hit. Yeah, but how are like, you guys, like, kind of going through that yourselves? Yeah, we... It's, you can't go anywhere, really. It's a bummer. They really locked down. They're kind of letting loose with some of the restrictions now, letting loose some of the restrictions, but um, still pretty pretty clamped down out down here. Um, a, lot, a lot of things you can't do, you know? Yeah, no doubt. Like, uh, I wonder how different it is in, down there. Because you're, you're actually, like, in a rural kind of area outside of an hour and a half or so outside of Chicago now, right? I am in a little farm town called Amboy. It's about 2,500 people. I really think there's less than that, though. It seems like it sounds really, really small. 
Um, you don't have much of a town down here at all. You just have like four bars and oh, yeah. town city hall and, and a little police station. The police don't even work on weekends here. They, 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 we rely on the county police to police us on the weekends. Oh, wow. It's funny, they, like, we can only, they can only pay for five days of cops being in this town. It sounds like a pretty slow paced kind of relaxed area, though, at least. And at least you can, uh, you know, you have a you have your house there and, and a yard where you can kind of sanction these raccoons and animals. So, I mean, it's it sounds like a pretty awesome place to settle. So that's yeah. Our house is yeah. really neglected for a long time, so it needs a lot of love. So we all I do is fix it up. All I do is fix it up every day, and Kristen helps out as much as she can. But she's busy with the animals usually. Yeah, like where where do the animals go after after they're done with there? Do they go back into the wild, or are they? Are they uh... Uh, she has a friend who has a big a big place to release them on. She's allowed to release them on this guy's land, who, this farmer's land, who owns, owns a lot of woods in this one area. Oh, okay. They call it the they call it the uh, what do they call it the forest. They call it the something. God, they have a good name for it. I can't remember what they call it this uh, something. It's all this forest and streams through it and a good place for raccoons to live. So we, we usually release them there. And they kind of look around at first and wonder what the fuck's going on when we first release them. And they realize they're free <laughs> and they go they immediately. Yeah. You wouldn't believe how much they adapt to, adapt to their, they adapt to their surroundings in one second, man. Whoa. They start climbing trees and going in streams and catching, catching little minnows and stuff immediately. It's so crazy how oh. their instinct is not. That's so cool. Set free, like it's very, very satisfying. Very satisfying to see them do that. And uh, if they can't handle it, they'll come back to you and they'll tell you they can't handle it. It's cool. Um, one raccoon came back to this girl Jane. It came right back to her, and uh, she took it back to her place because it, it couldn't handle the outdoors. And uh, it was really sweet. Yeah, that's that's no, that's seriously amazing, man. And I'm I'm glad you're doing that. You know, that's pretty punk rock itself. You know, and uh, yeah, I, well, I guess yeah, I had one more question. As so, I, I'm really really new to your music, and uh, and I, I say to everyone, I don't understand why I love punk music so much. I've really loved listening to your stuff. And if there's one song, um, this may be a bit hard, but I guess of the Naked Raygun catalog that you'd recommend me really listen to that you're super proud of. I'm sure there's many, but can you think of one off the top of your head for whatever reason today? I picked a song Treason. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's a good song. Brilliant song. And Evan Evan Evan's yeah, played on really, guitar. It's a really good song. It's uh Pierre wrote it and it's just just it just spells out his life at the time and now he felt so strongly about being true to yourself and uh not not giving in to the shit around you and uh it's a really good song. It's just it's well, well well written and well thought out and, and it just got it's got a good hook to it too, you know. It sure does. I, I listened to it before the uh, before our interview. It was an amazing track. So yeah, Ever, any other new new listeners out there, check out that song "Treason" by Naked well, Dragon. Well, let's let's maybe throw that one on. A, uh, I mean, "Treason" would be a great song to end this whole thing on. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, be good. It'd be really good. Yeah. Uh, I've always kind of been curious of this, anyways. But what was the recording experience of Jettison like compared to Understand? They're both done by the same guy, right? Both of them by Larry, Larry Sturm. Okay. I think. Uh, I think all, oh, maybe not. Um, who did them? Ian Burgess, an English guy, did uh, in the living in Chicago. Did All Rise, and he did Throb Throb, Throb Throb first, and All Rise. Okay. And then uh, next we went, then we went on Caroline Records, and he did Jettison, and he did Understand. And then the guy named Fluffy Arbach did uh, Naked Naked Reagan, which I think is the worst sounding mix of all, all five, which is one we spent the most money on, of course. But oh. uh, yeah, I think that this, he, did, he never got Bill's guitar sound down. He never, the, song is really, the album is really weak on guitar, and it's kind of, kind of not huge, really weird, that album. But um, I understand, and, and uh, Jettison recorded by the same guy in the same studio, so I think the recording, the recording session is pretty much the same. Uh, from Ian Burgess to Larry Sturm is a big difference, so Ian Burgess never never, never paid much attention to the background vocals. He sort of whipped them, sort of whipped them in there at the last minute, you know? Oh, yeah. And... Uh, and uh, he never got really good bass sound either, I don't think. But Larry Sturm got wonderful sounds, and I think he, I think Jettison and Understand records in the first two, but the first two have better songs, maybe. Okay, yeah, and um, I was actually always curious about um, Jettison too. About like, was it recorded like? Because back then, was it on like reel to reel tape? Yeah, it's on two inch it, tape, which oh. have all the tapes. So you recorded twenty four tracks to two inch tape, and then you mix that down to half inch tape. In, in the two two channels, and you and you send that to the send that to the studio. And uh, by the time we made uh, by the time we made Ray Gun, Naked Ray Gun, um, they were recorded on DAT, which is a tiny tiny little cassette and digital audio. Not quite the same. Hey, yeah, I I, I love those real trios. I actually have one, but it's kind of it's uh, I don't really know how to use it too well, and it's kind of something's wrong with it. But I think they're super cool, and yeah. I've always dreamed of you know recording on one or that. 
and I always that that the mix of Jettison, it would always like. Have you ever thought about trying to like a remix of an old album like that? Yeah, I could. We could do it. We have the tape. But the weird thing is, Albini Studio is all is all non digital. He doesn't have any digital stuff in his studio. It's all analog still. He has all the tape and everything. That is so cool. Yeah, it's really weird. It's the only studio like that in existence. I think it's the only studio like in the whole world now. I think that's why Led Zeppelin recorded there because. They, they could appreciate the tape, the tape quality, you know, they like, they're, they're used to that after recording on tape for so many years and they, they like going back to it, you know? Yeah. Like it's such an authentic sound too. And like, is, is Albini, so is he still based in Chicago? Yeah. He's still on Belmont in the same, same building. Yeah. Belmont Avenue. He used to, he used to all industrial buildings around him, but all like his building. Now it's all residential. It's all these expensive, expensive houses and stuff, but it's weird. He's the only one left in the neighborhood, but he used to be one of many, you know? Yeah. And it's actually that something just came to mind like that. It makes it makes me think of how everything's kind of really connected, like especially in the music world, like how, you know, he recorded Nirvana. Yet you played bass for Big Black a bit or you, and he recorded you with the bomb, but also Dave Grohl being in Nirvana and then Dave Grohl uh, going to the cubby hole. You know, he, he always brings up Naked Ray Gun and he did that big shout out for you and you guys opened for the Foo Fighters. Like, I mean, do you ever talk to Dave Grohl or he's just a big fan of the band and he was inspired when he saw you guys, right? That's that's what I, I hear. Yeah, I guess he was nine years old or something and he said the lead singer was all over my head and I think we were playing at the Cubby Bear at the time, Cubby Bear Lounge, which is really, which is really a sports bar, but they have this great back room where they have uh, they do anything you want. And this, the owner name is George. He still owns it. This, this Greek guy named George. He, he really loved this, and he, and he let us play there anytime we wanted to. But I guess we played there, and uh, Dave Grohl's cousin brought him there. They were in a band called uh, Verboten at the time, and uh, they're were, they were a really young band. They were like early teens, maybe, and uh, they, they played around quite a bit, but I only saw them twice, I think. How old were you when, like, around that time, like, when, when Ray Gunn started out? Like, I mean, Dave Grohl was, I mean, obviously he was, like, a kid. I, I thought I was probably 20 by then, 20 years old, 21 maybe. I'm about 10 years, I'm about 10 or 11 years older than him then. Cool, yeah. And it's crazy because, uh, yeah, when I when I heard him talk about you guys, it was like, well, yeah, obviously he's a, you know, I, I respect Dave Grohl, and I think that's cool that he still gives you guys the props that you deserve for, like, you know, inspiring his uh you know being in being in nirvana and and then foo fighters obviously but that's pretty cool like i mean uh you know uh i think i think you guys should do something cool. else with him sometime too because that's that's really cool that's huge yeah it's, it's, really, it's really funny he, he talks about naked reagan in front of every show he played that i ever heard and, it, and it's really nice of him to do that he only can help us you know and uh and he let us warm he let us warm up for him in, in indianapolis too before the day before the really field show that's so cool, man. Like, uh, when this COVID thing ends, like, uh, I hope, I hope, uh, some world tour happens or something, eh? And like, uh, who knows what, who knows what, I mean, if, if it, if it goes back to normal soon enough and we can have shows, no problem, like it's just going to explode, you know, like people are going to be more stoked and, you know, as long as everyone can be healthy and it, you know, this whole pandemic and whatever's going on in this world actually passes, you know, and we're going to get this podcast online and who knows, might be some new fans out there like, like me, relatively new fans. So that's the beauty of the, uh, the modern world and spreading it online. When, when is the new album coming out? I think it's come out early June, but before, before that, they're going to have two 12 inches out and have two 12 inches out, uh, 12 inches with, uh, living in the good times on one side and a live song on the backside, maybe. And then, then they're going to have a song that Paul Barker, Remixed? Are you familiar with, familiar with Paul Barker? Uh, who's no? Who's Paul Barker? He's a he's a big industrial guy, industrial music guy. But he uh, does he's, he's kind of been made famous of his, his remixes. He really fucks up the song bad. Like he he like twists twists it around and puts like all drums in the beginning and then brings in the guitars later and makes oh, it all sweet. sound really sick sounding. He makes the vocals really evil sounding somehow. And he mixes. I heard the mix is really hot. It's really it sounds good. It's, it's it's totally different, but it's it's like evil sounding sort of. And, he, and people will buy the record just for that, just for him doing it, you know. So that's gonna be that's gonna be a twelve inch all by itself. So he he took a part in in your album, in the new Raygun album. Well, they gave they gave him they gave him the, the album after that's the fact, you know. After it was done, he's gonna re, remix it. Remix is a hot, you know, like re, guys who remix, remix songs, like re, like re, guys who remix songs only. Yeah, so that's kind of neat. It, it's, it's it's really a different take on the band, you know. It's really very different. I just had a couple of random curious things. I mean, this whole thing will be edited, but uh, I was always wondering. Uh, I was always wondering the history 
behind the song Hammerhead because it's kind of like a dialogue and it sounds like um, you're in like a bar or something and this guy's like getting aggressive or something with like someone's going after his girlfriend maybe that's the th- thing I see in my head I love that song it's crazy how it's like it's the dialogue and blah 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 you know and then and then it erupts into this big like whoa and then it's like the drum roll and, and then it just erupts right like I mean that's it's such a unique punk rock song but I love it and I, I was just wondering like how how did you even write that song Pierre wrote that song <laughs> Song. He writes, writes really, he likes to write really different songs. You know, he writes, he's a very different kind of guy. He writes really odd songs. He wrote this song on a new album called, uh, it's called, uh, the, the, the nickname of it is Robert Mitchum. He called the Robert Mitchum song, which is funny. Robert Mitchum is such a big, big personality on the screen, you know. And uh, look, up some, look, look, look up some of his movies sometimes, they're really over the top, you know. He's like the super macho dude. But uh, the song is called uh, Soul Hole Baby. Oh, okay. And, it, and it's got, it's totally different. It's a really different kind of song. It's got, it's kind of like, not very, not very naked Reaganish at all, but it's, in, in the way it is, I don't know. You should, you should listen to that when it comes out. It's really it's totally different kind of song. Oh, totally, yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm really stoked to to hear hear the whole album in its entirety. Oh. There's 12 tracks on it, right? 11, yeah. Oh, 11, okay. 11 and a bunch of noise. So, is there stuff in between songs, like transitions or anything, or? Yeah, there's some, there's some noise noise transitions. There's a bunch of noise at the beginning and a bunch, a really bunch of noise at the end. There's like through five minutes of noise at the end and then in between a couple of songs there's some noise too like what kind of noise kind is of, it like a theme or dialogue at all or it's a song i wrote it's it's uh it's not in four four it's in it's in like seven eight or something like that time signature it doesn't it doesn't you can't dance to it you know? but uh it's got it's really very noisy and it's just repeats this one riff over and over and over and it's kind of cool kind of gets kind of kind of gets it's a song that's played in the this is a background song that's played in the uh in the uh Wax tracks, the wax tracks thing I gave you, sent you the wax tracks teaser. Oh right, yeah, like the the video. Yeah, pro- listen, promo. To, listen to the song in the background. That's 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 that's, 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 oh, that's the one. Okay, yeah, that was pretty heavy too. It had that vibe of uh, I want to say Peacemaker maybe like that. Yeah, like, I like that. Yeah, really on, on the verge of being metal, but it's not. It's just kind of an entity of its own yeah. or genre of its own. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like a, it's like a mood, like a mood song or something. 
And I, I remember uh, I'm still going off about some songs on Jettison here. I know, but uh, I, I remember you telling me before how you guys don't like the song Ghetto Mechanic. Well, the, the guys who are left over Naked Reagan don't like it because we just think it's sort of cheesy. It sounds like a cheesy, maybe Rolling Stones song or something. Oh, okay. I, I actually love that song for some reason. It's, it's unique, but I, I, I like it. It's a weird riff. Like, it's a weird chord progression. But uh, I seem to like it more as time goes on, too. type of song but I kind of, i've come to like it i think it's a cool like uh outer song and then and then also free nation i feel like that's maybe an underrated song like that's a pretty cool song what was that one kind of about the lyrics are pretty cool Pierre wrote that song too it's just about living in a free nation simple as that, simple as that. keep it simple We're free.
have to bring up Soldier's Requiem too before this all ends because uh, you were saying also at one point that you guys kind of stopped playing Soldier's Requiem live, which is of course one of your you know most popular songs. It's been in many skate videos throughout the years, and just it's really catchy and it's uh, such a crowd pleaser. Yeah, I think it is the most popular Naked Reagan song. It gets, it gets the most airplay. It gets the most most hits and everything. I see I see the, see the sheets are coming. You know, my royalty sheets. It gets hit the most. John Haggerty wrote that all by himself. Okay, yeah, and so John Every Hag- note. Yeah, and it's got um, it. The music is so unique, I think, too, because you know it's so catchy and whoa, whoa, like sing along, and then it goes into these dark musical interludes between the verses. The lyrics to that are, uh, I think, are taken from a poem. I don't think he wrote the lyrics to it. I don't think the original. I think he's taken from a poem. Type them in. Type them in your Google. See if they come up somewhere. It, it seems, yeah, it fe- yeah, totally. I'll I'll look it up. It's it feels like it's almost like a traditional poem of some sort. Or uh, it is. Yeah, it is. I think. I think he borrowed the lyrics from some some writer that wrote a poem to that effect. And uh, yeah, it is. I don't think John could have thought of that himself.
Are you still in touch with John Hagerty? <laughs> um, once in a while, they, 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 when they put out that, when they did a did a video, did a, did a, did a uh, somebody put out a movie called The Rise and Fall of Gator. It was a, this guy Kid Gutowski who killed this girl and buried her in the desert behind her his house, and he's in jail now forever. And they wanted to use one of our songs on the, on the movie. They used uh, I can't remember one of John, one of John and I wrote together. Maybe uh, we wrote together. Uh, we write together. We're together, uh, I wrote the lyrics. He wrote this music to um, uh, to uh, I I don't know. I wrote the lyrics. I don't know. He wrote the music. To I don't know. And they wanted to put it on the movie. So we had to get together and sign something together. So that's uh, the last time I talked to him. Yeah. So you guys are you guys are all good. There's no big rivalry between Naked Ray Gun and Peg Boy, right? Well, they say there is, but there's really not. You guys are both like kind of like intertwined, pretty much. You know, you know, Pierre being in both bands, and then John Haggerty. But also, I I saw a video online that uh, they played. Soldiers Requiem live too before, but I don't I don't even know what else to say about that. But I mean, you guys must go way back, right? And the two primary underground punk rock bands of the Chicago scene. But I mean, you know, Naked yeah. Raygun being one of the originals, and I saw the movie. You know, the movie uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, you weren't there. The Chicago history of yeah, Chicago punk movie. rock. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, a lot of people like both bands. A lot of people go to see both shows. Do you guys ever play shows together? No, they'll never play with us. Is it because we'll of play with the, them? They won't play with us. Is it because of the intertwining kind of thing, or? I think John was pissed off that Pierre played in both bands, and then uh, when we put Nick Reagan back together, he wasn't asked to play in it. I think I'm not really sure. I I don't really care. I, it's it's all a little beyond me, but I don't have any hold. I don't hold any grudges against them. I like their band. I think they have some really good songs. I like Larry a lot. Cool. Um, we don't play Soldiers Requiem. We don't play Soldiers Requiem now because I probably can't sing it. But we didn't play it before because John wrote it. Yeah. Oh, my son, I got one of my songs. One of my songs I put in a movie. The movie Tag got a lot of a lot of famous people in that. John Hall, John Hall, John Hill, John Hall's in that, and uh, the guy from uh, a bunch of bunch of good comedians are in that movie. But uh, I got my I use my song. Uh, what is the song called? Uh, can't remember. That's all good. Uh, so I'd like to personally thank you, Jeff, for sure. taking the time to do this podcast. It's been great talking with you. And I know hey. we've been trying to do this for months and we had big time technical difficulties last time when we tried to do it through Zoom and whatnot. But now we're doing it the old school way and it's uh, pretty sweet. And I'm really stoked to hear the new Naked Ray Gun album coming out this year. So if everyone out there who's listening, uh, obviously, if you're listening to this, you're going to want to hear the new album. So I hope it all goes awesome. And I hope to uh, hopefully maybe come down to the your area sometime and do do that do that cool creative punk rock stuff so. yeah let's do it get, get, get your ass down here let's do it after this COVID thing is over get, get down here we'll hang out hell yeah and uh yeah it's been a uh, great chatting with you jeff and uh your music is fantastic i really admire your longevity and integrity so uh thanks so much for your time thanks thank you very much i guess we're gonna end it on here on this is uh treason by naked ray gun check it out off the album understand mm-hmm.